Um, I forget what the I forget what the song was that we were playing. Any pretty much any of the Elton John songs. El, anybody seen a Moulin Rouge? Is that Elton John or is that Billy Joel? Anybody seen it? Moulin Rouge. Nicole Kidman's basically a a stripper with tuberculosis. Pretty much a highlight of the film. Yeah, pretty much. Um, and she works down in the red light district in France, and. It's supposed to be set in the 1800s, early 1900s, but it's got a full, it's got a really good music, Elton John kind of vibe to it. It's actually a really cool movie. Anyway, except dark and tuberculosis and a lot of coughing of blood, but whatever. Okay. So, um, let me wait, go back here. Why does that slide always keep coming up? Okay. So let's see, there's that. You guys are back here. That one. This is y'all. Okay. That's good. Wait, is that, is that you guys? Is that this class? I don't know. All right. It looks like it. It's not the, that's not the last one we were working on? Yeah, that's, that's it. Should be it. Dog in the Bottom up. Yeah, that's it. Okay. That's right. Okay, so. Um, so, whenever you hear any sort of, like, emotional song or smell any sort of smell that's attached with, like, some sort of strong emotion, what happens? Well, the main thing we were talking about is you start paying attention to it. Something be as soon as you draw your attention to it, as soon as you draw your attention to it, it becomes what we call a controlled process. So we got to back up real quick because that was all last week ago. But this stupid little formula has a lot to do with the way that our brain works and the way that you work in the world. This stupid formula. What does B stand for? Behavior. An S is a stimulus okay what makes a stimulus there's the word the association you have with that stimulus um, I tweaked my hip last week sometime and so my hip hurts bad pain we did a bunch of stupid uh, box jumps yesterday uh, one of the trainers that works out at works at our gym uh, he is an ex um, Israeli military guy and he's like super fit and he's like a little tiny like gymnast kind of annoying kind of person that only weighs like a buck fifty and so he can do like pull-ups for days and he climb the rope and all the cool things the big fat kids like me just can't do anyway so he was having me jump on boxes yesterday you know you jump up onto the plyo boxes kind of like I'm kidding I won't do that now so because that would be bad I'd fall down um, and, but, so you jump from one box to the other box, and then you jump to the little box to the tall box, which is standing sideways. And the, these boxes are made out of like this foam. Okay. Hi. They're like, kind of like high jump pad material. So you can jump on them and not crash and shred your shins like the wooden boxes that we typically jump on. The problem is when you jump on a tall thing that's made out of squishy, what happens to it? It's hard to balance. And that's actually the exercise is you jump onto this thing and you have to land so you're balanced, not falling forward or falling back or to the side. It's really easy to fall over. So I probably could jump on top of the stool, but I'm not going to because the probability of me falling is relatively high. I don't really have a fear of failure, which makes me much more successful, but also makes me get hurt a lot. So there's... On my snowboard, I have a little the stomp pad that you use to kick along with. It says, hold my beer, watch this. <laughs> and that's like, there's a mountain bike that's, that, that's the name of the mountain bike. Hold my beer, watch this. And it's a trials mountain bike that's just stupid. Perfect. So, what's the difference between hurting yourself and being sore?
So I keep going over the same example over and over again. The reason is because it's everything, everything in the world could be a reinforcement or could be a punishment. Okay, and can they both be the same time? The same object can have reinforcing qualities and punishing qualities. Okay, we were, I was talking with one of my students after class yesterday and after stats, and she lives down on Ensenada Street in Encanto. Um, I happened to be down there just yesterday or Sunday. Um, there's a guy that recycles old washing machines who lives down there. Okay, and so I've emailed him years ago if through Craigslist to, hey, I've got an old washing machine. Do you want it? He goes, sure. He picked it up. We started talking. Anytime we have a major appliance or something we need to get rid of or any large metal thing, I just go drop it off at his house. He can just, you can just leave it by the gate. <laughs> like, okay, thank you. Um, and he's super nice. And he basically refurbishes these kind of as a, as a side gig for his regular job. And so a lot of the people that live on that Ensenada Street, anybody know that street? It goes from Lemon Grove all the way to Encanto, all the way down. Um, but the houses are super cheap. And there's some really cool houses, like old Victorian houses built in the 1920s that are just freaking awesome. And then there's a few that are filled with people who sell and buy a lot of drugs. That's like our neighborhood, too. <laughs> the house at the end of our street was raided by the FBI, and they pulled out, like, machine guns and all sorts of stuff out of the house. I'm like, that's the end of the street. Welcome to the city, kids. Okay. But I was asking, I was like, you know, is it a nice place to live? She goes, all the young people, like your generation folks, are like rejecting the whole drug culture and are like getting out of that. They, they see the old people. The millennials are like sinking fast. But the young people are seeing the millennials sinking. And what are you doing? Not, no, not running the other way, standing up against it actively not letting, not letting it chase them out. And so they have houses that they can afford because it's cheap to live there. And they're turning the neighborhoods around slowly. It's really interesting. And it has to do with a lot with the associations that you see. My wife goes, oh, I, you're not going down there. That's dangerous. Somebody was killed with a bike wrench at our 7-Eleven. <laughs> it's a block from my house. <laughs> Wasn't me. Okay. So, so we were at Sears buying a stupid new dryer, and there's a, they have a you know, big rack of for sale tools, and I picked up this big wrench. I'm like, hey, Caleb. And he goes, 7-Eleven? <laughs> <laughs> Too soon? No, anyway. So, <clears throat> so looking at this, the only way to know what the conditioning is is the only way to know what conditioning is, is your, the change in your behavior. And so, and this is the hardest part, is that if, for, if someone, for example, has a drug addiction, why do they use the drug? Their, their body says, it makes me feel better than not using the drug. And that's sadly a lot of drugs, especially like meth and, and heroin. Those drugs make you feel good, period. Or nicotine. Those drugs make you feel good. And when, you make, when, they, when those drugs make you feel good, you are more likely to use them. When do you stop using them? Well, <laughs> yeah. When the jaw cancer catches up to you. Okay, but, or, or something all of a sudden happens where you go, oh, that's not really worth it anymore. But that's, when that happens, the association changes. And a lot, of a lot of that happens through the change of consciousness. Your reality is based on the stimuli you associate, not on the real reality. Your reality is based on your associations, not based on the reality of the actual world. Do you understand the physics of the world? No. We don't even know why things fall. Why did that happen? Gravity. We can measure it, but we don't know what it is. Diesel. <laughs> okay. How come we can measure it, but we don't know what it is?
Hey, that was nice and cool out there. Okay. How come we don't know what gravity is? Yeah, we, you can make a gravometer. You can actually make a, you can, the way that they find oil is they walk along and measure the, the gravity at that particular location. So as you're walking along and all of a sudden the gravity gets less, there's oil under the ground there. If it's less than the oil, then it's, well, the, it, what, if there's water, the gravity changes a little bit. If there's oil, it changes more. So there's gravometers. And how do we know where to put a satellite into space? It's, it's not trial and error. That's an expensive trial and error. Well, Elon Musk, a little trial and error, but not important. <laughs> he did throw his car up there, okay? Because he couldn't get parts to fix it. <laughs> oh, sorry. So, the, but we, we, don't, we, we initially started with trial and error, but then the mathematicians understand how gravity works. Therefore, we can do math and throw the things up there. And... Um, did Bezos throw the billion satellites up there, or does somebody else just do that? They're trying to get inter internet broadband around the world so more people can watch YouTube. Yeah, well, the problem is they also threw like 2,300 satellites up there. What's going to start happening? Space junk. Space junk. Crap. And all that space junk is moving at bullet speed. <laughs> so when space junk hits space junk, it makes smaller space junk. And the, the International Space Station has to keep going, putting patches on things where little holes keep getting punched into it by little pieces of space junk. Just, just look at the, uh, yeah, Wally, yeah. Just for, it's always funny for us because, like, when I got rid of the dryer, when I tipped it out of the car, like $6 worth of change just fell out of the dryer. Ching! <laughs> cool! Some rat poo, that's maybe a little upset. There's a rat living underneath it, evidently. It's nice and warm. I could explain the squeaking. Anyway. <laughs> no! 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 Okay. Or anybody a pinky in the brain? Yes. <laughs> He's running in the wheel. No! I think I'm getting somewhere this time! <laughs> Good times. Okay, sorry. So now, I have a big problem because I am a bottom-up processor. I am a bottom-up processor. Bottom-up processing means that I pay attention to what? details. Because I pay attention to a lot of details, a lot of times I get very distracted because I keep becoming conscious of new stimuli. It's called attention deficit disorder. There's a, a website that has a million psychological tests on it that we're starting to mess with with my research methods course. And one of the tests happens to be called the who styles test. Not like feces, but Winnie styles of who. Turns out that I'm 75% Tigger, 70% Winnie. Yeah, no piglet, which is good. If you have no idea about Winnie the Pooh, that's stupid. But you're wearing poo colors today. Good job. Okay, so what I want to do is I have no idea why I drew that little sparkly dot there. But what I want to do is I want to show you how your memory actually works today. Oh, that was a crank, yeah, a crank arm. I took it off. I took a picture of it. Because that's totally relevant. Thank you for pointing out useless details for me to remember useless things. It's your job. Oh, these are so good. I ate those yesterday. Barbecue cricket chips. No. <laughs> See all those little ridges in those teeth? Oops. These should go all the way to the edge. <laughs> yeah, that's a really nice one right here. <laughs> this is called having way more leg power than you have bicycle strength. So I literally just spun the threads off of them. Okay. I'll put new cranks on it soon. All right. So I want to show you how your memory works. How did you figure, how did you remember that? Did you write it down? How do you remember it? Yay, welcome to my world. <laughs> Once we start going back through 
the image that we drew last time, you can recall what we did during class. It's called episodic memory. You automatically encode. You automatically encode, and I'll show you what encoding is in just a second. You automatically encode time. Has anybody ever been reading a book and got lost in real time because you're reading your book? Nope. <laughs> nope. <laughs> haven't read a book in my life. <laughs> no. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. <laughs> so... My, my son and I, good morning, my son and I were reading the Harry Potter stuff. And, I, and when we, I read them with my daughter when she was little. Um, when they came out, I read them for myself. I love that kind of crap. So to me, that's highly entertaining. Um, and so I read them with my daughter and then I read them to my son until we got to about book five and about halfway through. And he's like, dad, do we have to keep doing this? He just wasn't into it. So what's funny is that a couple of times when he was into it, when he was younger, we would sit and read for about two hours, just sitting in the hammock or sitting in the backyard and just reading and not realize how long we were sitting outside. We, got, we sat out there in the hammock one afternoon and we were reading. We both got a sunburn. And how come we didn't realize we were sitting there very long? We were... When you start reading a book, your brain is not keeping track of the time of space around us, but it's keeping track of the time of the story that you're reading. Well, if it's a boring book, it doesn't hold your attention. Your attention keeps shifting off. But the fact that he's listening and we're, I'm reading it to him, he could tell me what happened in the book an hour ago in the book but he couldn't tell me what happened an hour ago in reality. See the difference? So you automatically encode time, but it's the story that you pay attention to. This is why we call it episodic memory. You remember the story. This is why reading is actually really good for your brain. Because what is it, when you're reading, what are you actually doing? Where are you getting the story from? Well, not the book. Well, okay. Where are you getting your perception of reality from? The way that the person described reality in the book. You, but it's not from the book. It's from the person who wrote its ideas. The book is just the medium at which it's being transferred. The person who wrote it, a really good book, then I, re I think the Harry Potter stuff's not the, it's very low written. It's not very well written at all. And we purposely didn't watch the movies until we had finished reading the book. Because when I read the books, there was no movies. I didn't know how to say damn lady's name, Hermione. Okay, I, how come I didn't know how to say your name? I read the word and there was no sound in my voice of Hermione. So who, I wouldn't say that. My sister said it one way, or my wife's sister said it one way. Um, and all, we all said it that like Weasley, Wesley. Does it really matter when you're reading? No. And I, so the, the, the thing about it, it's like we went to Universal Studios. Is you, anybody been to the Universal Studios Harry Potter thing? What'd you think of it? It was amazing. Universal Studios knows how to mess with you. They know how to put a story in your head. That's what they do for a living. When you walk outside of Ollivander's wand shop and you turn and you look up at the castle, it looks like a giant castle on a hill. There should be some sort of knight standing next to you. It's just a model. Shh. Because is it really a castle on a giant castle on a hill? No! Oh, it's in your head it is. In your reality, you look at that thing and it's like, wow, that is amazing. 
if you actually go on and take a photograph of it and zoom in, you can actually see that the bottom of it is about as wide as a, a regular house. And then it gets smaller as it gets, the physically each window gets smaller as they get to the top. They look like they're all the same size, but it looks giant and amazing on top of this huge hill far away. But if you throw a rock, it's about 20 feet away from you. <laughs> that ain't right. Don't do that. When you go, anybody, did you go to the tour when you drove around the movie sets? Yeah. When you sit, when you're driving down the city streets, you look up, you're, you're, it looks like you have vertigo because you're looking up in a downtown street. When you're a block away, buildings are all two stories high. <laughs> ah! Because what they do is they change the way that you're seeing the world so that your brain automatically sees it the way it should be, not the way it actually is. Such cool stuff. And that's why the, I, I really don't like the green screen stuff anymore because can they make CGI more real than reality? They're getting there. Like when they, they resurrected Princess Leia for <laughs> the last movie, she was dead. But why they resur how'd they resurrect her? Magic. Oh, it's CGI. Yes, there's no force. Stupid. Okay, sorry. Now. <laughs> so if you automatically record time, we should be able to find in your brain how you do this. Right? Good morning. So I want to show you how your hippocampus works. Okay, what, what zoom am I at here? Okay, that's good. I can zoom in. So this is an area of your brain... Okay, so I'm going to draw over here. It, it, well, it's called the hippocampus. It starts right by your amygdala. There's your amygdala. What's the amygdala do? Well, what does it do? It's not fight or flight. Fight or flight's down here called the medulla. It's the part that triggers the fight or flight. It's the part of your consciousness that tells you to run away. The fight or flight is just down in your medulla. That's just panic, run. The amygdala is the one that tells you panic, run. Oh, that's a spider, run. Um, we used to play a game as kids. We'd all stand in the street and wait for a car to come, and the last person to jump out of the way won. Adrenal gland is just the trigger. Is it, is it just the way that produces the adrenaline? That produces the chemical. And But your amygdala is the one that tells you when to panic or when to... What sensation comes in? Um, amygdala is the driver. The car would be the medulla. The gas would be the adrenal gland. So the amygdala is kind of in control. Sort of. It's a part of your emotional system. So most of the way the amygdala gets triggered is through association, not through real consciousness. It's, it's pre-conscious. It's unconscious. Okay? So... We're, the hippocampus is right around your thalamus, which we, I know we didn't cover this as much in the class. The thalamus is what regulates all of your senses. Uh, well, so like your, your vision goes through the thalamus, your sound goes through the thalamus, your sense of touch and movement goes through the thalamus, and your body's awareness of its position in space goes through the thalamus. So all of that stuff goes through the thalamus. And at, at the same time as it's going to the various parts of the cortex for analysis, it's running through this area called the hippocampus. So I'm going to write this one little word up here that we all kind of know. Maybe it's two words. Okay, it's the aha phenomenon. It's so like if I ask you to, like, if I play this sound, hey Google, play a doorbell sound. Well, Google's not going to listen to me today. Hey Google. I'm being shunned. Play a doorbell sound. This is a doorbell. So, if I ask you to remember that sound, okay? Remember that sound, and in 20 minutes, if you hear that sound, to raise your hand, okay? If I play that sound, 
before you even register it as a sound, your hippocampus goes, ha-ha, and sends a signal to your cortex, pay attention. So as the sound is coming in your ears, going to your thalamus, before it actually gets to your auditory cortex where you actually hear that sound, your hippocampus is already sending signals saying, pay attention. You see that? You, does that make sense? So like when my dog barked at the doorbell, was she thinking, oh, there's someone at the door? No, what was she doing? Literally just bah, just running to the front door full speed because her, her hippocampus said, aha, and immediately triggered a behavior. Now, if you take physio, you can learn a lot more about this. and You've got a good handling of the brain. There's a whole bunch of brain areas that are around the thalamus that help you respond to stimuli. So like if, if you're playing tennis, if you try to think, oh, there's the ball. I need to move over here. You will never, ever hit the ball. How do you know where to go to hit the ball? Hit the ball. Somebody plays tennis in here. You just look at it and start moving. You don't have to think about it. The ball's moving one way, and then you just immediately start going, and your hand immediately starts going if it's this way, immediately starts going if it's this way. You don't have to think about it. You just trigger a series of behaviors just by seeing one little thing. It's really fun watching, um, yeah. The, the, the way the person, each aha moment, the more you play, gets sooner and sooner. So like, it's not just position of the ball, it's position of the person who's about to hit its hips. The position of their hand, where the racket is facing. And you, you don't even notice, you couldn't actually quantify this. Like my, so, we were at the park on Friday, Friday after school. We went to the park, and my, we were playing with the... My son wanted a Frisbee, so we got an Aerobee. We have a big park near our house, and it's really fun to throw. Um, and so he keeps throwing it, and it goes sideways, like every time. He, he, his angles are bad. This little kid named Assad comes up, and he goes, can I play? I'm like, sure. He, like, first throw hits the dirt. Second throw hits a tree. Didn't get stuck. Third throw, he's like, zing. Boo perfectly flat. My son's like, what's wrong with me? I'm like, yeah, it's my genes. Sorry. <laughs> this kid in just three throws programmed his body to do exactly what he wanted to do. And, the, and the, when you throw, when my son throws it, it goes high and starts moving and you have to kind of judge where it's going to go. This kid immediately goes, watches it and then starts running not to where it is, but to where it will be. Do you think this kid plays sports often? Yes. And one of the things that my son for basketball that really helps him play basketball better is throwing a football with him. We actually have a rugby ball and we go and throw it all the time. Because what are you practicing? It's more than that. It's, it's predicting where something's going to be. He can get his hands on the ball. The hard part is, is that he doesn't know where it's going to be. So he has to practice trajectory chasing. Has anybody ever shot skeet in here or trap? It's really fun. You throw a little clay disc. Don't call it a pigeon. People get upset. <laughs> you throw a little clay disc and then you, if you just follow it with the gun and shoot and keep following it after you shoot, it's really fun to, sh it's really fun to shoot them. Yeah, rats in, the, our, in our yard with the BB gun on the wire. Clunk. No, no squirrels. They're cute. Rats, get under my house. Don't like them. Okay, so now. So the more you start to learn about the way the brain works, the less you know about how the brain works. Just because the more we understand, it makes you ask more questions. Okay, so I want to show you how memory actually works in the brain. So I'm going to go to this part of the hippocampus, and I'm going to zoom way in. Okay, so what do we see on, in, this, in, this, um, in the background now? These little grids. Each neuron coming down this way. I'm just going to try to... I can't draw a straight line to save my life. I could make a straight line, but I'm not going to. Okay, so this right here is sensory information. Hold on.
This is sensory information. And so you can imagine that all, every single sensory nerve is running down through this hippocampus, just running down, okay? And so all the sensory information is being broadcast through this hippocampus. Sitting on top of it are other neurons. Sorry if you have OCD and this is killing you. Okay. Okay, so sitting on top of it, sitting on top of it are other neurons. And this is what we call semantics, which is way too fat. So a semantic are details. Okay, so semantics are details. So we have sensory information coming in, and then we have semantics or details going across the other side. We also have another set, movement or behavior. So I'm going to put up a picture for you and describe how this works. Sensory information is going down, down a grid, going down, going south technically, and then east and west are semantic details going back and forth. So far so good? Okay. So now, let me go back here. And on our last mountain bike ride prior to my crash, I didn't really crash, just broke stuff. With their, the whole, right now, the mountains are full of these. They're almost done. They'll be done by the end of the storm. Okay? What are these? Anybody nerdy enough to know what these are? Plants. Can you eat it? The green things. Well, they're pretty purple right now. Smell good. Okay. These, this is called coelacanthus. Well, it is. It's, it's, it's a western lilac. Okay, um, they smell amazing. These are the reason that a lot of the trails and mission trails have been shut down because they're endangered species of Western lilac. The last two years, three years, they've been really blooming extremely well, which has been very nice. Um, two years ago when we had a crazy, um, super wet winter, these things were just insane. This year we've actually had a very good wet winter as far as San Diego goes. So these things have been cranking pretty good. There are two species here. There's white and purple, okay? And if you look at them up close, because I do this kind of crap, you can start to see that they're very interesting little flowers. They're really kind of cool. And the color is super vibrant. The, the purple ones are called lakeside coelacanthus. What color, what color are typical coelacanthus? Can't I? <laughs> white. They're really, there's, a, there's one branch that, there's one type that is super dark purple, and that is specifically a very unique one to San Diego County. That's the Lakeside Coelacanthus. But the white ones are very typical, and you find those pretty much everywhere. Anybody drive the 94? You see them all along the side of the 94 for about maybe two weeks or three weeks while they're in bloom. Okay, so I'm giving you a lot of semantic information. You can kind of see they come forming clusters. And you don't really notice it until you kind of zoom in and pay attention that anywhere there's a north facing slope, what do you find? A ton of these things. All the north facing slopes. They don't like a lot of hot sun. So the north facing, I'm lifting, the north facing slopes are where you find a lot of them. And now that you see it, would you, know, would you just think it's purple sage? If you didn't know what you were looking for? Yeah because there's a sage out there that also has purple flowers that it looks just like purple sage. Except purple sage grows on the sun side, not on the dark side of the hills. Okay, useless information, semantic information, details. So what sensory information do you get from these plants? What, what sensory information do you get from these plants? Okay, so the smell would be right here. Let me change this to purple. Okay, the color would be right here. What else? 
How else would you recognize that plant? The shape of the flowers would be right here. What else would you, how else could you recognize the plant? Yeah, you could look at the location on the hedge. You could also look at the time of the year. So if these nodes in that pattern fire, I'm going to write this word up here and change the, I'll change, not have magical font. Resonate. If your hippocampus, re, what's resonation, what's resonant mean when something resonates? Vibrates at the same time. When something it resonates, it re it resonates, it vibrates. So if these cells fire at the same time, now that you know the word, what are, what is that plant called? <laughs> Western lilac. Good. So you found one. Is there another word for it? Lakeside something. Coelacanthus is the answer. Okay and. So when I texted my buddy Jeff, who my buddy Jeff is a field biologist, he is in charge of uh, waste uh, runoff for San Diego water. He knows every watershed in San Diego, every pretty much plant in San Diego, all the invasive species that are coming in here. He doesn't like bass fishermen. Um, I just threw that out there because he, he's a trout guy, gets irritated at bass fishermen. Um, I caught him fishing for bass though once. Uh-huh. Closet bass fisherman. Okay. Anyway, so, but anyway, so he immediately saw the pic, I sent him the picture and I said, Hey, do you guys, you have these growing? He lives in Crest and Crest is at the right altitude and he lives on the north facing slope of Crest on the eastern side of the freeway, or not freeway, but on the eastern side of the way up to Crest. And he goes, no, but, and then he started rattling off all the stuff he knows about coelacanthus, lakeside coelacanthus. There's six, six different ones that are floating around down here. But what's great about it is, is how does he have that semantic information? No, it's not smart. Watch him try to have a relationship. <laughs> <laughs> I, I love Jeff. Jeff is awesome. Because the sensory information has been encoded with these semantic details. These semantic details then go to your brain and start producing behavior. Now, in this particular case, the behavior is activation of vocabulary. <laughs> you kind of, it kind of, it's weird to call it that, but it's really cool because all you have to do to remember something is to encode or resonate different frequencies. So, in the first week of class, I tried to remember everybody's name. And I think I did pretty well until, uh, well, I remember him now, it's Brandon, because he cheated and told me the, 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 he didn't tell me his name, he told me the association. And I remembered it was one of my son's school friends, but I couldn't remember which one. So I, I initially said Brian, because Brian sat there, that's Sean, okay, but, and Cody. Okay. <laughs> There's a, the, one of the guys in Cody's uh, house where he lives, um, has the coronavirus. Yay! And his, he's from Seattle and he tested. And so his parents said, well, you might as well go back to school <laughs> and send him back. So, you know, just so we could, yeah, rub some dirt on it. Be fine. All right. Okay. So uh, we'll all get it eventually and we'll be fine. Okay. We'll be fine because you won't be here to hear me dang next time if you're not, so don't worry about it. Um, no, it's, it, what's, the, what's the death rate so far? Yeah, depending on where you ask and depending on what population you're in. But yeah, it's not, it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a bad flu. But if you're, unless you have a compromised immune system, you, you'll be fine. Um, that's why we have these now. But it says don't use on the computers. So wait a second. What's the part that most people are going to touch? The computers. Nobody the labels. No, no, this is a label that the people that are IT folks put it in here. Yeah, not don't. Yeah. So 
Um, wash your hands. Don't pick your nose. Okay, I'm a very bad face toucher, so I'm, I'm, I'm doomed. Okay, my immune system's good, though. So no matter what you want to try to encode, the better, the better you resonate with the material, the faster you encode information. Because my buddy Jeff is a biologist, why do you think he remembers all the stupid names for all the stuff? It's his job. That's what he does all of the time. Practice. Is that what you said? Is that? Yeah, that's it. Uh, sorry, I've talked over you. Okay. Um, but he, he does, this is all, that's what he does all the time. I remember a lot of useless school stuff because that's what I do. I've been doing it for 30 plus years. I literally have not missed a semester in school since kindergarten. Okay. So for, I, that's what I do. And so what's interesting about this is, is as you get smarter, I wouldn't say I use the word smarter because I don't mean smarter as far as actually being more successful in life because <laughs> that's not the same thing. Okay. So every time you learn, every time you learn, it requires less nodes to activate your memory. So every time that you, you learn something again, it takes less effort to activate your memory. So hopefully you have old people in your, in your life because old people are very interesting. Um, my father-in-law went to a funeral for one of his really good friends. And due, due to the nature of his good friend, he died from pancreatic cancer, um, it wasn't a funeral, it was a roast. So pretty much everybody got together and they told, they all just told stories. There's probably about 200 people there and they all got up on stage and told stories bagging on each other and Dean, the gentleman who passed away. And he said it was the best funeral service that they've ever been to because they celebrated each other's lives and the way that they all worked together. Um, this is a guy that my, my father-in-law played basketball with at Crawford back in the early 60s. And so, and Dean was, so what, 6'9"? Big D. <laughs> he called my father-in-law, who's 6'3", little guy. <laughs> you know, he has to duck when he comes through houses. You know, he's 72 or 73 years old when he passed away. Um, but what's interesting is that when they're telling the stories, how come those stories from 40, 50, 60 years ago are coming back to them so easily? you automatically remember your life. You don't have to try. You don't have to put much effort. It takes less and less effort. And the, the older you get, the less nodes are needed to recall those memories. And what's funny is that my father-in-law always has like a couple stories that he shares with us about Dean. And it's funny because he always remembered the same five or six stories every time he's starting to tell stories again. Why remember those five or six, not everything? Say it louder. You, you said. Those are what resonate the most with him. And if they resonate the most, that he remembers those faster. So resonate really just means, whoa, that was cool. Resonate really just means activation of neurons. So the more times you resonate these things, the faster you remember them. That's why the funeral was so good, because did each person have a different set of stories that resonated with each person? So they built this entire, for four hours, they built this entire repertoire of Deanisms that happened over the years, and everybody remembered the stories because they all grew up together, but everyone remembered the stories anew because they heard it from different perspectives. It's really a powerful thing. That's the way, that's the way to have a good funeral. Um, and then he came home and dumped about, I don't know, a half of a pickup truck full of old fishing gear on my driveway. And he goes, hey, Nancy, his wife, wanted you to have all this stuff. 
In other words, Nancy didn't want it in her garage, and now it's in my garage. Thanks, Nancy. Okay. Um, so the, the thing about this, how many different grids do you have? I wouldn't say trillions, but definitely millions. Lots. You have 100 billion neurons. Good luck. Okay, you, watch the third step. Okay. You have 100 billion neurons. Well, if you're hurrying to get out, you go step that. It's awful. Okay. <laughs> so if you have 100 billion neurons and a couple million of them are dedicated specifically for memory, all you're doing is resonating different patterns of these. Same cells, different patterns. You automatically remember, well, not automatically, you remember faces. You, you remember faces. There's actually a disorder called prosopagnosia. Did I tell you this before? Okay. Prosopagnosia is a disorder where you can't remember faces. My daughter's ASL teacher, American Sign Language teacher, her, um, Mrs. Ronco, can't remember faces. So we had a meeting with her in the morning about my daughter's IEP for her um, dyslexia, which is not relevant for ASL because she doesn't have dyslexia when she's signing because it's a different part of the brain. Not important. Anyway, but she was the only teacher who showed up because the teacher has to be there. And she, she met us and stuff in the morning. Come on. You made it. Okay. So she, she met us in the morning. We had a nice conversation. We were talking with her. That evening was back to school night, and she had no idea who we were. Hi, I'm Mrs. Ronco. Like, we just met this morning. And as soon as I said something, she goes, oh, you're Ella's parents. Because what did she recognize? My voice. So my voice is what resonated with her consciousness, not my face. And there are some people who just can't remember faces. And that's what's called prosopagnosia. So of course, me being the person that I am, I go, oh, you have prosopagnosia. She looks at me and goes, you're the only other person who knows that that actually is a thing. Yeah. <laughs> my wife just shakes her head and walks away. I'm full of useless information. OK. But, so, but most people automatically remember faces. You automatically remember this, too. Space. So you remember space. So when you walk into a room, your hippocampus immediately forms a grid of that room. When it forms a grid of that room, you immediately know where you are in that room. So why do humans not do well in the forest or in the trees? Everything looks the same. If you ever, if you go up, well, if you go out hiking in San Diego, guess what? That's what it looks like. But again, even if you, if you go to a very specific place, this, this is pretty much the native stuff. And when you, if, you look at, if you look at mission trails, depending on the time of the year, this is where the mission trails is, this is what it looks like. Can you tell the difference between one ridge and another ridge if you really don't have a lot of experience out there? No. There's a bunch of trails, if you ride along the top of the ridge, not getting shot by military people, you can drop down, and there's a million of these little little fire roads that follow the power lines down the hills. And the problem is, is when you're at the top of them, every single one of them looks the same. It has the same rocks. It has the same plants. It's hard to tell the difference between which ridge is which ridge until all you need is someone makes a duck. What's a duck? No. A duck is a little pile of rocks. Someone makes a little pile of rock. They're called ducks. And the duck tells you, this one. Now, it's really fun if you're a kid, you move the duck and put it on the wrong one. And what do all the people who don't know what they're doing do? Go down the wrong trail. <laughs> We're not kids. We, re we respect. But at the same time is that as soon as you see one of these little ducks, what does it give you? A point of reference. That's the key. So every time you have a, your brain generates a map and it gives you a point of reference. You automatically record that. That point of reference is where something resonates and immediately builds your space around you. It's really cool. So neuroscientists have actually can record these and find that if people use them or not. 
And it's really fascinating because you automatically encode space. You automatically encode faces. What's the third thing you automatically encode? Time, the episode. Those, these three things are automatically encoded. These details are automatically encoded. This is what your hippocampus is for. Does anybody have a cat in here? Cat, nobody? Cat people? Oh, sorry. Okay, <laughs> so the cats, cats have an amazing sense of space and time. Cats have a real, well, they're prey also. What do cats mostly eat? Mice and birds. Yes, they like fish, but that's not normal. They're, they're not normal in their diet. Okay, cats, and, cats eat, well, lizards, <laughs> anything that's small and runs with a tail, and birds. A cat will sit and watch a bird for hours, like my son watching YouTube. Um, and it's crazy. We used to have a, a bird feeder outside of our house, and the cat, every day, would come up and sit on the chair and just for, for hours watch the birds. Periodically, it couldn't handle it and pounce against the glass. Because it's being triggered by the way that the bird's moving, it makes the cat just go insane. As far as it can't understand reality anymore, it just loses its mind. It's kind of fun to watch. Okay, so, but cats have an amazing sense of space and time. They can be in exactly the same space at exactly the same time every single day for years because they have this amazing sense of space and time, but because their prey also has a sense of space and time. If you see a rat somewhere, where should you put the trap? <laughs> where you saw it? Because the rats will follow exactly the same path for days until something happens and then switch and then never go back to that same path again. We had a bunch of, I think I talked to at the beginning of the semester, but you ever see a, one of those old movies that they open the ship and all the rats run out? Like the rats filling a sinking ship? That's what it sounded like in our garage when, when the neighbors cleaned a big wood pile. All the rats fled. They went into our little room that we keep our water heater. And then they went under the house. And yeah, that's what the BB gun's for. Um, but then, it, when you, as soon as it got dark at night, 9 o'clock, exactly at 9 o'clock, we'd all get quiet in the house, and you could hear them running. And eventually, we set the traps where they were running, and every night, we got three or four rats every single night. And then the possum figured it out, and the possum went by and ate the rats out of the trap, so we didn't have to clean up the rats. What? Yeah, the rat, the possum's like, oh, are you sure? <laughs> <laughs> Probably like gained 60 pounds that might, that. <laughs> yeah, well, it's just you'd hear the, <laughs> and then crunch, 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 and then the trap would go clunk on the deck. Sometimes they'd take the trap with them. The raccoons take the traps. The possums? They just, they, they just eat the stuff out of it. It's good. Possums know not to go for the, for the bait in the traps, though. Anybody know why? The rats taste better than the stuff in the trap. <laughs> this one morning, there's like rat bits hanging at the, below our deck. So we put them up, the roof rats, and so, or the tree rats, so we put them up, all the traps up on the top of our awning by our back deck. And you just wait for it gets dark, digga, digga, digga. snap, 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 three. <laughs> oh well, sorry rats, get out of my house. Okay, so, no, I feel bad for rats. I like, I like all creatures gross and slimy. So, the idea of these nodes, how can you use this to remember things then? What do you have to do? You have to you associate nodes. Wait a second. What creates nodes? Sensory information. Stimuli. So the key is to try to associate stimuli. Now the problem is, somewhere over here I wrote it, 
Somewhere over here I wrote this. Oh, episodic, there it is right there. If all you had to do was remember what happened yesterday, life would be great. We automatically encode that. And for a lot of people, all you have to do is remember where you are now, where you were then, and you are good to go. But what do you as college students have to remember? Well, you don't have to remember everything. You have to remember a lot of what we call semantic information. What is semantic information? What do you guys have to know? Like, yeah. So without going into too much cognitive psychology, language itself is really fascinating. It's where you take semantic details from your consciousness, communicate to someone else so they can unpack those semantic details and recreate your consciousness. Whoa. So when you think about poems, they're trying to find a way to communicate the way that they're thinking to you. And, it's, and it's, it's the idea of using these semantics, using details, using language, is how we communicate our ideas to other people. It's very hippie crap. But at the same time, semantics are not automatically encoded. There is a few people who on the, on the spectrum of autism who do automatically encode things. Has anybody ever seen the movie Rain Man? Rain Man is a movie um, that Dustin Hoffman was, played a character named Kim Peek. Kim has a type of autism where he remembers everything he's ever read with 98% accuracy. If you Google Kim Peek, there's a really good documentary. He passed away a couple of years ago. Um, there's a really good documentary about his life where he would go and talk to people about being different. Because he is. He's very on the spectrum of autism. He is very profoundly mentally disabled. However, he remembers everything he's ever read. So there's a real, if you watch the documentary, it's really fascinating. Um, if, if someone emails me, I can, I can, I can send out the link. Um, but he has a line of 300 um, elementary school kids who all did research. And they're walking up to him and asking him questions. In the 1963 World Series, who, what was the batting average of the second batter? Kim Peek knows it because he read the statistic book. J answers every single question just like that. But does he have to think about it? No. For him, as opposed to all of his sensory information, the, the, his brain, for some reason, is different. And everything he read automatically is completely encoded into his long-term memory. And that's the thing that we, that, that we start talking about is that how long does your memory last? Well, wait, so hold on, hold on. But so how long did this semantic information last? So there's sensory memory. There's short term. And then there's long term. Sensory memory lasts now. Sensory memory is your current experience that you're in right now. The world that we live in is about a tenth of a second long. If something changes faster than a tenth of a second, you really can't tell. If something changes a little bit slower, you notice it. And this is, this is actually where we are in my cognitive class right now, right between sensory and short-term memory. It's called attention. Your short-term memory lasts as long as you pay attention, whatever that means. It lasts as long as you pay attention. There's a gentleman named Clive Waring. Clive has had encephalitis and he had a brain, basically a brain infection and it killed his hippocampus. He hasn't, does not have any short-term memory. Okay? I'll show you a clip of that in just a second. I'll stop the stream. And as a result, where does he live? Sensory. He lives in his sensory experience now, but he doesn't have consciousness. No consciousness. And I'll, I'll show you this in just a second. But then I, want, I just want to go through this and talk about what long-term memory is. 
Your long-term memory lasts forever. Ish. Every time you learn something, do you knock something else out? Is it like a, a limited space? <laughs> no. <laughs> you can, every time you learn something, you're technically relearning it. The biggest problem, I'm going to write this in rainbow font because it's really important. It's interference. The biggest problem is interference. Interference is our two conflicting memories. Two conflicting pieces of information. Has anybody ever had to get a new phone? Then you had to change phone numbers? It's, they actually, they, this is a big problem, so they actually now, the FCC, whatever, Federal Communications Commission, basically said that it doesn't matter, you can keep your phone number. So I have some friends that, are, that went to BYU. Their, their cell phone numbers are still BYU cell phone numbers. They're still from Utah. Yeah. And it's, it's, it's funny to me because it's like, the, the, your, does your phone number really matter anymore? No, but when I was a kid, all the, all the people who lived e uh, south of town had 878 phone numbers. Everybody who lived north of town had 879 phone numbers. And then if you got 877, that was Essex. Oh. So the, the, we only had six-digit phone numbers back then, four, seven-digit phone numbers back then. We didn't have, everybody in the entire state of Vermont was 802. It still is, actually. <laughs> they haven't run out of phone numbers yet. It's a small state. Okay, but in San Diego, we have how many, what are the prefixes that we have? 858 and 619 and what's the third one? 760. Okay? And 760. And so, the, but, by, but what, when you have to get a new phone number, it really sucks. I can remember some of my ones from college. I remember my wife's phone number when she lived out here. She grew, went, to, went to Valhalla years and years and years ago. And I remember her phone number out here because I used to dial it all the time. How come I don't know my son's phone number? I can just call him. I just tell my phone, hey, Google, call Caleb Weiner. Calling Caleb Weiner. Uh oh, OK. So it works now. So I, I don't know his phone number because my phone knows his phone number. What happened to my memory? I never encoded it. I know my daughter's phone number because I made sure I knew it when she got her phone. I just don't care about my son. Okay. Um, yeah, he's fine. Okay. So it has to do with interference. We tend to outsource our memories. We outsource our memories. Could I have Google Glasses on that would pop up your names? Yeah. I can take a picture and code it into my, with a name on it. Like I can tell my Google Photos, let's look for someone named Lisa. Yeah, that's Lisa at her wedding. Man, that was a long time ago. Okay, she's not married to that guy anymore. Um, <laughs> just saying. Um, we called it too, by the way. Um, so, <laughs> but how does my computer know that's Lisa? I haven't tagged Lisa's face before, but I have on Facebook. No, yeah, yeah, Skynet. Okay, so I it it knows my friends. Well, it does because I use it all the time. The more I use it, the better it knows things. The, so there's less interference. I did tag Caleb in this. So if I Google, if I Google Caleb, what shows up? Wait for it. This is in my Google Photos. And then all of a sudden, we start getting pictures of Caleb. Oh, and our Bob Ross Chia pet that we won at 7-Eleven at 7-Eleven. Awesome! <laughs> it's awesome! We, we didn't, we didn't, he did not read the instructions, though. 
And so we basically had a very cancer looking Bob Ross because it was, <laughs> it did not work well. Anyway, but um, right now it's got a bunch of succulents growing out of it. Yeah, he's a man. Okay, so now, but it has to do with interference. So your short term memory, you said lasts about seven to 10 pieces of information. It has to do with interference. If anything interferes with your attention, what happens to the ability to store it? It goes down. What happened with my ability to remember your names? Every, well, I have all of, I did the same exercise in all of my classes. And by the time I got to the end of the first week, it's 500 new names and not enough nodes. There's too many nodes that are firing, especially in here. I have three, four classes in here. Is there a node for that space with four different names on it? But why do I remember Sean? He resonates because my neighbor's name is Sean. And it's easier for me to remember. No idea. Wait, say it. If you remember, if you remember the association as opposed to your name, I can remember your name based on the association. Is that the association or is that just your name? Oh, okay, that was, that's kind of easy. But if, so if he just tells me his name, I'm not going to remember it as fast. Okay? But it's Michael, right? Yeah. Damn it. Mark, Luke. Okay. So, yeah. <laughs> you got it. Okay. <laughs> Genesis is excellent. Sorry. <laughs> so, well, the catechism just come flashing back in my head. But so, so if I try to remember people's names, I remember it began with an M, so I just guessed one that, so that the M started there. So what I can do is, I, if I just, if you just tell me the name, I won't remember it very long. But like when you said brand, or salsa dad, immediately my brain said, Eric, that's not right, because my friend Eric is a dancer. Yeah, it really sucks. He was like the really most awkward kid ever. And then like at our wedding, him and, and a bunch of girls were all like, like dancing, like ballroom dancing, dancing. I'm like, where'd that guy come from? He was like the most dorky kid now. He's like Rico Suave. He married a thoracic surgeon. They live in Somerset, Boston now, like the really fancy parts of Boston where they don't have any plastic. It's all made out of wood and recyclable stuff. Nerd. Okay. I'm working on it. I eat cricket chips. Um, <laughs> so I just want to, I'm going to stop the recording here real quick. And I want to play this right before you guys go. So you can really kind of see how this works. I know it's almost out here. One man is consigned to live entirely within the present with terrible consequences. Clive Waring has the worst case of amnesia ever known. Twenty years ago, he lost his memory, and now his wife, Deborah, is the only person he recognizes.
the sentence he is in, he will probably have forgotten the sentence before. You ask him a question, uh, and he'll give you an answer, but while he's giving you the answer, he's already forgotten the question. That's how short it is. Do you know what they're asking? Mm -hmm. Listen carefully. I've never seen a human being before. Never had a dream or a thought. The brain has been totally inactive. Day and night the same. No thoughts at all. As far as I'm concerned, the doctors have been totally incompetent. I've never seen a doctor. Not the time. Okay, so yeah, it is 10 second Tom from the that's where 10 second Tom got his thing. But think about why does he say I've never had a thought? Everything is completely silent. He can't remember his own consciousness. So for him, he is living in a space that is void. Only thing is now. Then you start to realize where consciousness really is, except his wife. His wife, and that's why I, I really don't like the movie 50 First Dates, because they kind of make fun of 10 Second Tom. But think about what 10 Second Tom's life is actually like. It's, it's basically instantly, like he only thing he does is he gets, his wife triggers that emotion and he immediately remembers her because it's going through a different path than through the damage of his hippocampus. How come he can play the piano? He, he know that's a different motor behavior, behaviors through a different process than conscious memory. Different process, different parts of the brain. Okay, bring questions about memory back next class.